Steve, happy Tuesday, man. Uh, happy Tuesday to you. Yeah. Have a good Labor Day weekend. Yeah, it was pretty low key. Did stuff around the house. Still, my office slash gear room's a mess, as it always is this time of year, throwing stuff together for upcoming trips and got some shooting in both for myself as well as with my daughter trying to get her ready to shoot a deer this fall. So yeah, man, that was good. Oh, that's cool. I didn't realize she was going to be able to hunt this year. Yeah. She, she told me flat out, I think it was last year, like dad, I'm done hunting with you. And I was like, what? She's like, unless I can shoot, I'm done hunting with you. So, <laughs> cause I, you know, I'd, I'd take them in like a ground blind or in the tree stand with me while I was bow hunting and they got a kick out of that, but she's past that now. So she, she, she really just was like, I'm not going unless I get to shoot. So we're trying to get some practice in. So it's fun, man. Cool. It's fun seeing them like work through discomfort too. Cause she, she had shot my creed more before uh, a couple times and did great, but then it had been a little bit. And so we went to go shoot again this weekend. She's like, I don't know why I'm scared again. Cause I know I've done this, you know, and just like watching them work through, like, this is not going to be comfortable or I'm scared of this, but I still want to do it. You know? And I'm like, if you don't want to do it, don't have to do it. No dad. Like, I know I can do it. You know, just watching them work through that stuff. Super fun. That's cool. Yeah. So, um, a big topic we wanted to chat a bit about if folks listened to the last Monday minute was you're getting ready to head off for uh, getting sheep country, which we'll talk about first. One thing though, we totally screwed up the last Monday minute, Steve, I didn't tell you. Hmm. We mentioned, you mentioned, so I'll blame this on you. Um, since you brought it up, you mentioned splitting peak refuel meals into separate bags to break up portion size uh-huh. as well as potentially save some weight on packaging. Mm-hmm. And as you were bringing that topic up, like in my head, I'm like, we better talk about how we are then cooking these after we repackage them. Cause I know that question is going to come up. And so that was in my head and I meant to talk about it. We didn't touch it. And we had more than a handful of emails of guys who listened to that podcast and was like, okay, so you, you split the peak meal or mountain house, pick whatever you want into a separate bag. How are you now cooking it? Uh, so we need to talk about that because we have many emails. What did you do, Steve? I mean, I guess short answer is I'm probably giving myself cancer, but I'm just cooking them in the Ziploc bags. <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> like I didn't do anything. Yeah. I got like the freezer Ziploc bags. Yeah. Uh, so a little bit more stout. And then it's actually really nice, man. I just pour the boiling water in there, um, you know, kind of mix it all together with my hands um, and shake the water and you can just physically see into the bag and make sure everything's all mixed together. And then um, for the most part, it seems like pretty much every time I was eating, I was also making a drink, um, but I would just take that Ziploc bag and then put it, wrap it up in my sleeping bag or my puffy jacket, or just kind of get it wrapped in whatever insulation I had laying next to me on the ground. And then I was sipping um, like I brought apple cider on the trip. So I'd be like sipping my cider. And then 20 minutes later, my cider would be gone. I'd go to eat the meal. And I just dropped the Ziploc bag into my jet boil. And then it actually worked out really well just to like roll the opening over the top of the jet boil. Um, and it just makes it super easy to eat. So um, I don't know if those Ziploc bags are okay to put boiling hot water into what kind of chemicals they release. I did last year, I did... I had these vacuum seal bags from Cabela's and they said boil safe on them. Um, so I felt good with those ones. Um, but I'm yeah, on the Ziploc bags. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I've done all of that and a few other options. So I guess just to run down, you hit on a couple that I would bring up. Number one is you can use Ziploc bags. Definitely don't buy cheap off-brand non-freezer ones, right? So you want them to be as stout as you can get them. Um, so the freezer bags in general, and I try to stick to name brand just cause you know, if you're unsure of the quality of a, a generic, it could be hit or miss. So mm-hmm. it's an option, as you said, Steve, questionable ish, maybe I don't know. Like we'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's not like we're doing right this now. every like, night. Yeah. 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 I it's think not if like you're I'm doing this a handful day. of times a year. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what that looks like. But the other thing I would say, the downside to the Ziplocs is kind of the handling. So most of, you know, if you take like a peak refuel bag, again, Mountain House, pick whatever you want. They're a little more structured. They're easier to handle, easier to hold. The Ziplocs, especially when they get hot with that boiling water, get super soft. 
Um, and so, as you said, they're just not as easy to hold or handle, especially when they're really hot. So you must have to set them down and then get them into something like your jet boil, uh, to eat out of. If not, you're just basically going to be holding the top zip portion, almost pinching that and holding it. Cause you can't actually hold the bag in the meal if it's hot. So get it in something, you know, cozy, a jet boil, something like that. Just make handling easier. I have used the vac seal bags quite a bit. They work great. Obviously they have the bonus of you can re vacuum seal a meal so you can save space there. Um, those bags are definitely a bit beefier. Um, those work really well. The other option to consider would be to hop on Amazon and buy bags mint for meals. So just like peak refuel, mountain house, whatever you can buy unlabeled kind of generic, but high quality bags that are very close to what they use, if not identical to what they use. So if you get on Amazon and search for like Mylar or aluminum foil bags, um, that's a good option. A lot of those you can buy where they're resealable as well. So they have the zip. Um, again, you're not necessarily saving much weight now at this point, cause you're adding back in a heftier bag. But if you're doing this for creating portions or like I do, if you're making your own dehydrated meals and you want a really high quality bag, that's an option as well. Um, and then the other thing that I've done in the past is Ziploc makes a hard sided container called twist and lock. Um, they're very light, but it's basically like a, a jar and you can use those, um, to reheat a meal in, uh, and since it is a hard sided container, I just dual purpose that if I'm packing it, um, and put snacks and food in it during the day. So essentially I have this hard side to container. It fits really great in one of our lids for our packs, have my snacks in that in there throughout the day, it's getting empty. And then at the end of the day, um, you can rehydrate the meal on that. I took mine and covered it in reflectix type, um, insulated material. And so it does stay insulated as well. So that's a rundown of some options. We definitely got a lot of questions on that. Steve, did you find out if you're going to get cancer yet from Google? A hit and miss. Yeah, I've been looking this whole time. Hit and miss. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will I, say this. It's, yeah. If you do this 20 times a year, it's right. probably not any worse for you than something else that you're already doing. That's probably that's, terrible for you. That's a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think the the Ziploc freezer bags are are good uh, from what I'm re- seeing here. Yeah. If I mean, know, there's but, like you said, the off brand cheap stuff or just your s- standard sandwich bag, they're saying they melt at 195 degrees and boiling water is 212. Mm-hmm. Um, so they'll start to melt. And that's probably where you get plastic and stuff in your foot food. I think the, the freezer bags are built a little bit tougher than that. So yeah, um, yeah, it's probably a 50, 50 thing, but you know, whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the bags from Amazon, you know, you can get that are more food style. I wouldn't recommend those if you're just repackaging food, cause you're kind of losing part of the point of potential weight savings and space savings. But if you're doing dehydrated meals, they are great. You can buy, um, the stand-up kind to make handling easier. If you can go to, um, the vac seal bags, I think those are better than Ziploc, but if you don't have those or don't have a vac sealer, just get the yeah. heavy duty Ziplocs and they'll work for sure. What I, what I liked about the Ziploc bag was it would be able to seal it back up. When I did the, the vacuum seal ones last year, obviously you can't seal that back up. So they were kind of long and skinny and I could roll it up and mm-hmm. be okay with it. Um, but uh, it was nice to have the Ziploc ones where you just seal it and it was good to go. And I nothing leaked on me. I, I, did, I did have one just inside my pack get a small hole in it because um, I just had them like free floating around like I normally would. And I ended up after day one, I had an empty food bag, you know, my gallon Ziploc bag, and I just put all the meals in that. And then, then they were fine the rest of the trip. So, mm. well, that was uh, nerdy and boring, but we got a lot of questions. Hey, More importantly, little... Steve, how's your freaking <laughs> time in the Frank? Uh, I mean, uneventful, learned a lot, but yeah, I mean, I did not see a single sheep, um, saw some tracks. Uh, I feel like I, um, underestimated the size, not necessarily the size of the country, but how long it would take me to move through it. Right. So I'm planning out my day, like, all right, I'm going to 
start hiking from the trailhead here. I'm going to get it here and glass for the last two hours of light or, all right, you know, day two, I woke up because day one, I didn't make it like two thirds the way that I wanted to. Um, part of it was the country was tougher to move through. And part of it was also like everything looked good. So I, I never like just put my head down and pounded out miles. It was like, go hike half a mile. Like, man, I need to stop in glasses hill for five minutes, you know, just make sure nothing's here. Cause it looks, looks good. It looks sheepy. Um, and so I had a combination of like, there's just so there's so much burn and open country in the Frank that it's just so tempting to glass uh, and it looked good. And then also, um, I guess the, if there was one overarching story of this whole thing was I, I was joking with you, but I think I legitimately got cliffed out a hundred times. I mean, it was, it was nonstop and it wasn't, it was frustrating because they, like, I, you know, in the middle of it, I'm like, how did I miss this on Google earth? Um, you know, I, I know in Onyx, you don't get near the, the, um, quality imagery, especially once you've, you know, you're going on your offline maps, right. Of your, your uh, aerial stuff, but on Google earth, usually you can pick up cliffs and I went back and they just don't show themselves there. Like you see kind of a rocky thing, but it's like, yeah, that's nothing. I'll just walk right by it or walk right around it. And you, you get there in person and it's a 30 foot cliff and, um, kind of happened on night one. I was hiking, hiking up and I wanted to get up to this kind of, Oh, high, kind of this little peak. And then it flattened off. I was like, okay, once I get up there, it looks good on the like, top of the lines are kind of flat. I'll be able to find a camping spot. Well, I'm hiking up and I'm staying, you know, I put on the headlamp and it's getting dark. And then I it, like gets kind of rocky and, and cliffy. And I'm kind of climbing up this thing and I get up on top. And all of a sudden I realize like, I'm like, like everything around me, 270 degrees in front, front side, left, right, uh, was cliff. Like, like, holy crap. And then I was like, I don't want to go back down. I just came up on the headlamp. And so I literally just uh, threw out the bivy sack right there, wedged in between some rocks and spent my first night there. Woke up in the morning and had to like climb back down when I just gone up and drop around and circle around it. And that whole day was, was that story. I would, you know, just be be bopping along the ridge glass and checking things out and working my way, you know, left and right of little rocky outcroppings and all of a sudden come to a cliff and have to backtrack and it just happened over and over and over again. Definitely just rough country. Um, but like the cool, like my one highlight of the trip is I'm 95% sure I heard two Rams butting heads at some point. Uh, it was nine 30 in the morning on day two. I heard like, I I've never heard the sound before, but I saw it described or somebody told me it, you're, it's going to sound like a gunshot. And sure enough, I was just sitting there glassing and like, son of a gun, someone else is back here and just fired off a gun. But it sounded like a, sound like a suppressed 22 it wasn't crazy loud or echoey but it was a very sharp clean sound and um i never could find what made the sound what sheep made the sound it had to have been it there's no way it was like a it would have had to been like a completely flat rock falling from 15 feet onto a completely another flat rock with no Mm -hmm. no rolling downhill or anything like that it was just a very sharp you know crack sound um so that was like i know there was sheep there it's kind of frustrating. I couldn't pick them out. I mean, granted it was, a, I was in a Canyon that's five miles long and a mile across and it's like 3000 feet down below me. And then up the other side, I mean, it's a big, massive country. So they could have been anywhere, but, um, it was frustrating. I couldn't turn them up. Um, but yeah, it was, it was overall, I, I, I think I did like 43 miles over four days. I don't know how much elevation, you know, 15,000. I mean, it was just constantly up, down, up, down, up, down. And, rough rocky country and saw some bears i did see some i was told i wouldn't see any deer at all i saw four nice bucks um had one elk walk by me at like five yards which was kind of cool i sent you the the cell phone video i showed it to my kids and my little little man joey was just like oh 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 he was so excited (laughs) about it It was so cool (laughs) um uh, but yeah it was a great trip i I mean i the goal was i you know i I didn't want to go in and kill something on day one or day two, you know, just like, I want to stretch the, stretch the hunt out a little bit. So I was glad in a way that I didn't, that I didn't kill something, but it sure would have been nice to actually physically put eyes on a sheep, uh, at least some lambs and ewes or something. Um, But uh, yeah, heading back in Friday for a five, six day trip. And uh, I'm going to be a little bit, probably five miles away, same access point, but um Instead of peeling off up a ridge, I'm going to head down the canyon another, oh, five miles and then hunt kind of the lower section of that same ridge system that I was on. So 
um, just a spot I've been told there's been sheep in the past. So we'll go in there and, um, or I'm going solo again and see what it looks like. But mm. overall it's awesome. Had, um, gear wise pretty dialed in. I ended up, um, I pat for glass. I've got my eight by 42 EL ranges, which man, I freaking love those things. Um, but the eights don't have a lot of great reach in that country. You know, it's, everything's a mile across and then all that, um, all that's, it's, it's like, uh, it's the complete opposite of when I was up in Alaska last year and on in the Alaska range on that doll sheep hunt where it's like, once you get above the brush line, it's just open rocky faces and you're looking for white, uh, you know, white animals. It's pretty easy to glass. This is like finding a sheep in a where's Waldo freaking thing. Like it's just, you know, all these different colors of rocks and terrain and trees and bushes and, you know, burnt and standing timber. I mean, it's just a mess of, um, just, I don't know. It's, it's hard to pick stuff out. That's for sure. Like it's, it's a matter of, um, you know, the, the few people that have been in there are just like, you gotta keep your eyes behind the glass. Cause that's how you're going to find them. And if you do everything right, it's still, you're going to have to just get lucky and catch one walking across an opening. Cause it's, it's just tough, tough glassing in there. Um, so I brought, um, that goes, that goes back to I've never actually packed like 15s, uh, 15 by 56 binos on a hunt before. Um, not on a backpacking hunt. I took them once on a scouting trip and compared them to 10 by 42s that I was using at the time. I was like, I don't really see the benefit here. They don't, I still got to pack a spotting scope. Uh, if I want to zoom in and, and see something up close and, um, you know, and then I've taken my, we used them on the bear hunt this year and I tested out those SIGs, which were incredible. So I, I kind of got my hands on all the 15s. And even uh, I had the 18 by 56 Vortex and then the 18 by 56 Mavens. Um, kind of got my hands on uh, those ones as well, just to test. Ended up taking the Mavens with me on the trip. Um, and I probably won't take them this next trip. I think I'm going to take the SLC 15s. Um, mm-hmm. It was so, one other thing I mentioned is like, there's two fires nearby that were just blowing up. Like one was, within miles of me and another one was like eight miles away, but they were, uh, you know, or 10, 10 miles away. Um, but, uh, they're blowing up. And so the smoke, well, it'd be clear one minute, depending on like which way the thermals and wind were blowing. And then the next minute I couldn't see across the Canyon. It was like, okay, I guess I'm just glassing what's directly in front of me and super hazy. And those, those mavens at 18 X, you know, um, just like spotting scopes are super susceptible to like, it's, pretty rare you can use one above 50x going into that 60x because the atmospheric conditions don't like the the image just gets crappy you're trying to Mm -hmm. zoom through too much haze i basically i I had that problem with these 18s to where it was um it was just so hazy that i was like i had it was way better just to glass through the eights so um Mm -hmm. I, i wish i had like some really nice clear crisp days to to compare them but i ended up just defaulting to using my eights the whole time Um, and, and just pulled those 18s out when I needed to see something a little bit more detail. Um, but, uh, yeah, on the next trip, I think I'll take the 15s, uh, test them out and kind of have two in the field experiences with, with them back to back weeks and see which one I like better. But, um, yeah, I think gear wise, I ended up uh, (laughs) with like the shoe battle. I, I ended up wearing some Solomon, uh, uh, shoes and man, they were money. Like, oh, I, I, yeah, I didn't have a hot spot the whole trip. Which they, one? They're the new, they're not the, they're like speed cross mids. Oh, yeah. Um, they just came out, I think, this year. They did. And yeah. I went, I was like debating on what to wear. And I grabbed these ones and I'm pulling up Solomon's website right now. Cross hike is what they're called. Cross hike, cross hike Gore-Tex. Mm-hmm. They were freaking money, man. Like my feet were so comfortable. They're, they're miserable, not miserable, but if I was like, if all I was doing was side hailing the shale and rocks all day long, I'd want something different. But even in that country that has a lot of it, you know, for the most part, I like, okay, I'll, I'm, I'm climbing straight up a ridge or I'm dropping straight down, or I can kind of like avoid those sections where the shoes don't perform well. Cause 99% of the time they perform awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, go, the traction was phenomenal. Like my feet, you know, it was hot. That was another thing. It was, I, I bet you that 
oh, my third day in there, I had to be like mid eighties, 85, 86. It was freaking hot. Um, and my feet weren't sweating that much. You know, they are Gore-Tex, but it's just such a thin shoe, thin layer of fabric on top of the Gore-Tex that they, they do breathe pl- pl- plenty well. Um, so yeah, I, I was blown away by them. They were, they were waterproof on the way in and I didn't test them on the way out. <laughs> no one Solomon's. I don't have any, uh, doubt that they probably were already leaking by the end of the trip, but it was also, you know, it's dry country and it's, um, you know, obviously I wouldn't pack them on November trip or something like that. It's going to be raining and snowing a lot, but for that type of, that type of terrain, that type of, um, you know, weather, they were just fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah. One thing you said, we were, we were chatting earlier before we were recording just about the trip and all that. And you, you mentioned, I can't remember the exact words you said, but essentially that, you graded yourself after the trip. And in context, you're talking about, you felt like you hunted it well, covered country well, that type of thing. But that idea stuck out to me Mm. to think of for listeners that may not do that. Like maybe they walk away from a hunt, a scouting trip or whatever, and they're just not super, you know, strategic about doing a quote unquote debrief or some sort of self-assessment. You know, maybe there's a certain moment that sticks out of like, oh, I botched this, but looking at a trip as a whole in terms of, did I cover country effectively? Did I meet the goals that I wanted to do, et cetera, et cetera. So just, you know, you mentioned it, but elaborate on that thought of how you do that, why you do that. Like just what's, yeah, what's that yeah look it's like? been a very um, active thing I've done. You know, I was 10 years ago, I decided like, okay, I want to be a better hunter. How do I do that? And obviously to get better at anything, you have to analyze where you're at and what you're doing so that you can improve upon it. Um, and I take that into every single hunt that I do, especially it's amplified on, you know, if it was like an elk hunt, it's like, okay, I've done this, you know, not a million times, but I've done this plenty. I've, um, but a sheep, this is a new, you know, bighorn sheep hunt. And it's like, all right, here's, here's my strategy going into it. Did I execute it properly? Um, did, you know, did I take advantage of everything that I, you know, put, put every chip and or card in my favor that I could. Right. Um, and what, you know, like as I'm in the trip, I've got my Google keep out, which is like a note keeping app that I use for a lot of stuff. And I, I, I had a thing of like in hunt notes, you know, and I was making notes of little gear changes I'll make for the next trip and things that surprised me. And one, one of the big ones that I kind of mentioned there was just traveling through the country. I, I need to I'll probably take it down by two thirds. Right. So um, and if, if I think I can do something in three hours, it's probably four and a half hours that I need to plan to get somewhere. Uh, just, you never, sometimes I had a few little one mile, two mile sections in there where everything went according to plan and just moving through the country, you know, at, at the right speed. Um, and other times, uh, the, my last night in there, I was like, I was on this long ridge coming back down to where I thought I'd heard the, the sound of the two rams cracking horns. And I was uh, not even two miles above where I'd kind of picked out, like, this is where the sound was above it. There was this little flat spot on the top of like, I'm sure I could find a camp spot there. I was two miles ahead of it with like three hours of light left to go. <laughs> and um, I was like, okay, I'll sit here in glass for a little bit and then I'll be my way down there. Probably take an hour and then I'll, I'll have, you know, a good hour, hour and a half to sit there in glass. Well, I didn't get down there until freaking dark. Um, it was I ended up getting cliffed out and it was like, I had to, it was a weird how it progressed of like the cliff started forming on my left and then on my right. And then I'm looking at the top of like, yeah, no, I could, I, I should be able to stay on the Ridge and just drop down this. And I finally get out there and it's like, yeah, no, I'm not going down that. Uh, like that's uh, it wasn't completely cliff, but it was, it was one of those steep where if I slid and there was cliffs below it, you know, that, that didn't look good. Uh, if, if I was maybe with a buddy, um, you know, maybe we would have tried it, but solo, I'm definitely just more, more cautious back there. Right? Like I want to, I want to get home to my family. So, so I had to backtrack like half a mile um, to where I could finally then drop down below the cliff and, and get back out of there. And it ended up not being until dark till I got to camp. So I missed my whole evening glassing thing that I'd planned that night. So that was one of the lessons learned from the hunt. And then, um, you know, I, I also kind of all grade, you got to like look at Google earth. And then when you're, when you're physically there, the country just always looks different and you kind of got to match the two up, right? Like, so now I know just because the cliffs don't show up, 
that well on Google Earth in there for whatever reason. Like, a lot of them are, are small. They're 10 feet, 15 feet things, right? Like, that doesn't show up on Google Earth, but it's like you're not going to just jump off a 15 foot cliff. Um, so I learned I was paying attention to like matching up the terrain. And now for the second trip, I'm, I'm much more critical of how I'm looking at Google earth and, and how I'm going to pick my routes traveling through that country. Um, I did water, right. That's one thing I graded. I just packed, I basically packed about seven liters of water at any given time. Um, it's a lot of freaking weight, but it's just necessary. Um, I never, you know, it was a bummer. I never needed it. Like I always had every time I got to a place I was going to refill, I had three liters of water. Um, but I, I, someone had mentioned to me, a guy that I was talking to about sheep hunting in there. And he's just like, yeah, if you, you got to pack that extra water though, even if you think you're going to cross water the next day, cause what, what if you don't, what if you get up on top and there's a sheep up there above you even higher and you go kill it. And all of a sudden now you're, you know, you're off your plan and you got no water, right. Or you only got a liter of water left. So you just got to always have that. It's like having a band aid in the back, like kind of mm-hmm. emergency kit of have that extra water. Cause it, I truly didn't, unless it was like a stream in the bottom, um, I did not come across a water source in there. Um, not a single spring, nothing Mm -hmm. like everything was, um, to get water, you were 2000 foot minimum from the top down to the, to the creeks. And there was water in the creeks. They weren't dry at all. They were flowing and good, but there's just nothing, just a wasteland. Like once you get out of the Creek bottom. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so just overall, just graded myself. Like, how did I do on the hunt? What could I do better? What am I going to change for the next trip? And, um, and kind of got all those notes written down and take them into this next hunt and hopefully execute it even better. I like it. Let's hit, uh, let's hit one question briefly, just so we work in some listener questions. And then I know we got a lot to run to here this week is, uh, trying to take care of work before the next hunt. Right. Um, this guy wrote in, basically he has an REI quarter dome SL2, which he uses for most of archery season and earlier hunts, but he's looking uh, long story short at more late season hunting options uh, and a shelter that's more suitable for um, that type of weather. Vicious storms, he mentions colder weather, that type of thing. So to boil it down, he's basically considering, does he want to go with something like a Hilleberg specifically he's considering an Anjan two, or does he want to go with something like a seek outside shelter with a titanium stove? So he's just weighing the pros and cons of those two options specifically for late season hunting. Uh, I have follow-up questions to that, but I don't have all the details obviously, which is why I have follow-up questions, but what would your first thoughts be Steve? Like if, you know, price is roughly equivalent and things like that, yeah, I mean, his, specifically for late the, season. The, the difference between his REI quarter dome and a Hilleberg, as far as, I mean, it just, I guess I don't know what kind of late season he's talking about, but I, that anything in the lower 48, um, I would not be afraid to just take that REI quarter dome into right. Uh, in November, um, you know, maybe if you're like, it's pretty rare. You're going to be like, Oh, I'm backpacking in and I know it's going to, it's calling for a foot of snow tonight. Right. Like you're probably going to hang out and not go in unless, you know, unless you're from back East and you're going in for that trip and that's your only time, but there's not going to be a huge difference there between those two tents. I mean, sure. The, the Hilleberg could potentially handle more snow load. Um, but you know, there's not, there's not really such thing as extreme high winds in the, in the lower 48. Um, in my experience, you know, I know there's pockets and areas of stuff like that, but for the most part, if it's windy and crappy, you can find a pretty sheltered place to put the tent and kind of get out of it. Or up in Alaska, sometimes that just flat out is not an option, right? Like you're pitching the tent here and this is brutally exposed to the wind and the the tent better be able to handle it. Um, there's a lot to be said for the TP stove setup. I've used them just a few times over the years. Um, I see, you know, I always go back to, I hate the footprint of a teepee. They just, you're so limited on, you know, if you're truly mountain country, like there's just not a lot of flat spots to pitch those things. They just have a massive footprint and, um, it's just tough to find those spots. So, uh, it's a tough call, but I think it could be absolutely essential to keep you in there. If you can, you know, if you've got a big storm in the middle of a hunt and, and, uh, get you in there and get a fire going and get things dried out and, keep you in there longer. So I don't know. Yeah. When it comes to late season, I, I try to do 
personally just do shorter trips, right? Like it's going to be cold and miserable. Um, go in for three days, come back out, warm up, dry your stuff, go back in. Um, that's kind of typically my thing. I haven't done too many like seven plus day hunts uh, in November. Yeah. Yeah. That was my thought process as well as like knowing how much is he really talking about backpacking versus just like a shelter. And maybe that's, you know, at a trailhead or at the truck or, mm. you know, he's more base camp hunting. And it's just thinking of these shelters for that, because there's a big difference between truly backpacking and then, you know, hunting and having the opportunity to maybe go out. Um, and that's what honestly, what I consider Steve would be like, let's say you do have that seven day later season hunt you know, we've talked about this before, but ideally you just have like an option of versatility, right? You kind of have an arsenal. Maybe you have a shelter or you can live out of your truck or something like that. If the weather's truly terrible. And then if you have this weather window or you now want to go out for two, three nights and truly backpack, you can take something like that quarter dome, um, that's going to be sufficient. So it's like, the, the probability of bad weather increases, obviously, as you get into later season, colder temperatures, snow, potentially higher winds, things like that. But it's also a personal decision decision on, are you really going to put yourself in those conditions in the backcountry while backpacking versus, you know, being more at a base camp situation? I, you know, what you mentioned there, and I guess I just have a sour experience given my brief but lesson to learn by experience history with Alaska is is that a consideration in the future right as you said there's just flat out times you can't get away from those higher winds I would rather take a Hilberg to Alaska than a teepee so if that's like on your radar that's another variable to consider for the future so there's a lot to consider there both are good options both definitely have their fans like there's people who are diehard Hilberg there's people who are diehard TP and stove. You know, I even think through things of livability, you know, TP does have perks there of, you know, just being a little bit taller, right. A little more spread out. Um, obviously on a later season hunt, whether you're passing bad weather or just dealing with shorter, um, daylight and more downtime around camp, you know, that livability factor, is something to consider. So yeah, those are just, uh, decisions to weigh through it'd be fun to maybe hear what this guy decides and what his context is and maybe that'd help other listeners so we'll stay in touch on that but steve there needs to be like a legit like a hill like a hilleberg with a stove like it seems like the stove only goes with the teepees and i'm not aware of like yeah hill like a hilleberg compatible with a wood stove would be like a badass setup Um, yeah yeah i'm not sure that exists i haven't seen it right i mean that's one thing with with throwing the stove in there is you automatically going back to the downsides of TVs and footprint, you have to create more space, right? Like you just can't be ducked right next to the stove. And then, you know, you take a quote unquote six man TP, but now you throw a stove in it. It's not even close to a six man TP. Um, yeah, definitely, you know, it, I don't want to say complicates things, but it changes the variables for sure quickly. Yeah. The stove. And I guess, I know I've mentioned this before though. One of my times on it, like the first time I'd ever used a stove, it's like, it's still, you still have to pack all the stuff as if the stove doesn't exist. Cause you're not, unless someone's willing to wake up every 30 minutes or every hour all night long to keep the thing going, like you, inside the tent gets it's just as cold as the air temperature within five minutes of that stove going out. Uh, it's not like there's any heat retention, you know, with that, with a 30 D still nylon. Um, so you still got to pack all that. Um, you know, all the freaking cold weather gear. You still got to have your 10 degree sleeping bag and extra clothes and all that crap. So yeah, I think they're a nice, like, it's almost like um, packing a pillow. It's like a nice comfort, but it, it doesn't like make or break anything for me. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. yeah I mean, it could going back to personal factor. Do you want to deal with the stove period? Right? Like it's another right. thing to pack. It's another thing to set up. It's another thing to maintain. You're going to have to go, spend time uh, getting the fuel for the stove, keeping the stove go. Like it just adds a lot more work yeah. essentially. Right. And again, I'm not saying it's complicated, but you have to think through, is that something you truly want to deal with? Right. Or can you stay warm without a stove, even an elite season hunt with good gear and be happy? Like, I don't know, that's your call, but those are all things to consider for sure. Cause there definitely is, 
you know, the difference for sure. Big time. Yep. Cool, Steve. Well, uh, the story continues with sheep hunting. We'll definitely be back and, and keep sharing more. And obviously a lot of you guys are out on hunts now. We'll be soon. The, the response to the EXO experience giveaway has been awesome so far. Only the first weekend of September, it's been so fun to see stories and photos and all that. So if you guys are hearing that for the first time, just go to exomountaingear.com forward slash experience, and you can learn all about that. The prizes we're giving away throughout the whole fall, uh, this month in September of 2021, giving away gear from Spartan Precision. So once again, thank you to the guys who've participated already. It's been great. If you guys have hunts coming up soon or want to learn more about that, Again, go to xomountaingear.com for such experience or look for the link in the show description. As always, if you have questions for us for the podcast, just send an email to podcast at xomountaingear.com. We'll talk to you soon.